do a webcast on understanding and navigating the challenges of dementia during this time of COVID-19. This event is possible through the generosity of the Public Health Agency of Canada, through its Dementia Community Investment Program. And we have partnered today with an esteemed panel of experts who I will introduce to you in a moment. Please note that this program is being recorded, but none of you will be seen, only the panelists. Two quick notes before I get going. There's a Q&A button at the bottom where you can register a question, either in French or in English, and we'll do our best in this limited time to get to most of them. Also, you will be receiving a confidential questionnaire tomorrow that will help us understand the impact of this event and how we can better serve you in the future through our services and programs at Cumming Center. Your feedback will be greatly appreciated. So now, let me introduce you to our amazing presenters. Dr. Jose Moret is a professor and the director of geriatric medicine at the McGill Faculty of Medicine, the McGill University Health Center, and Jewish General Hospital. In addition to being academic lead of the McGill Dementia Education Program, he's co-director of the Quebec Network for Research on Aging and past president of the Canadian Geriatric Society. Welcome, Dr. Moret. Hi, everyone. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Serge Gauthier is the director of the Alzheimer's Disease and Related Disorders Research Unit of the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging. He's a professor in the departments of neurology and neurosurgery, psychiatry, and medicine at the McGill Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, as well as the co-academic lead of the, of the McGill Dementia Education Program. Welcome, Dr. Gauthier. Merci, Joanne. Bonjour, tout le monde. <laughs> Moderating and joining the paddle, panel in today's event is Claire Webster. Claire is a certified Alzheimer care consultant, a certified professional consultant on aging, and the founder of Caregiver Crosswalk Incorporated, her own consulting company. She is also the program founder, ambassador, and lecturer of McGill University's Dementia Education Program. Wow, Claire. <laughs> now... <laughs> <laughs> I know your story a little bit, and it's truly a remarkable journey. But Claire, for those joining us here today who may not know you, tell us a little bit more how you came to find yourself devoted to this work and what led you here today. Well, what led me here is unfortunately, really what I would say, the lack of information that I received uh, upon my mother's diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease in September of 2006. You know, unfortunately, I was not provided any type of information, education about the disease, you know, the way it was going to evolve, what type of support services that, uh, you know, that I would need, that she would need. And I really believe that the, the lack of education uh, really resulted in the quality of care that she received throughout the course of the illness. And most importantly, the lack of education and support had a significant ripple effect you know, on my own health and a ripple effect on my family, and which led me over the past almost 15 years now to want to become an advocate in the field of dementia education. And um, I guess fortunately at the time, um, you know, if Dr. Moret or Dr. Gauthier would have been my doctor, I wouldn't be here because I would have been properly taken care of. And so would she, but um, it was really just because of the lack of information, which, you know, um, which is the re which is the reality of most families. Sadly, that you know, there's no prescription of care given given to families when they get a diagnosis. Okay, Claire. So I am going to hand this over to you. Uh, we've prepared some questions, so go ahead. Yeah, great. Well, first of all, thank you so much to the Cumming Center and the Public Health Agency of Canada for allowing us to be here today and educate as many families as possible. Um, I'm with my two esteemed colleagues. And I thought I would begin by really asking uh, the two of you, you know, the question that's on many people's minds right now is really about, can you talk to us about what the situation with COVID, why is it having such a significant impact on seniors? And what's the situation right now in the hospitals? So Dr. Morin? I, I could start certainly. Hi, everyone. Um, I, I would say that that older persons, because of the aging phenomenon, they're more susceptible to the consequences of the disease. But all of us, we are affected the same. And, and uh, uh, what I would like to put emphasis on is that as human beings, we need contact, we need to be uh, uh, 
uh, felt that we, we, we are loved, eh? we are important to the eyes of others and older persons even more so because they have less, I would say, capacity uh, to, uh, you know, find solutions for, for themselves. So uh, the fact that there is less interactions uh, causes more isolations, not so much in terms of physical, but as well as, uh, you know, at the mental level, uh, the, 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 they feel disinterested, less motivated, uh, the lack of routine that they were usually uh, doing as part of the lives because the support received, all of this has been dismantled. And as a consequence, I feel it's harder in older people that is in, let's say, middle age or younger persons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gochi, what are you seeing in terms of uh, families right now? We, my uh, contact with uh, persons with dementia and their family is virtual. Because of my age, I have to see them through Zoom or phone for the past, what, seven months now? And um, my global impression is uh, that the people have managed at home the best they could with mostly family resources. Uh, the children had a little more time perhaps than usual to help for groceries and practical things. Um, there's a new normality <laughs> that we're facing now in the second wave. I'm also happy to say that many have uh, received CLSC help now. There is help coming to the homes and there are even people who are now able to get into uh, long-term care facilities. Okay, so people shouldn't be as afraid. Uh, is there a better handle at the long-term care centers than there was from at the beginning of the, the situation of the crisis? I don't have direct experience with that. Maybe Dr. Moret does. Yeah, I could say that uh, indeed, uh, to different uh, mechanisms and, and, and uh, situations, uh, uh, we know that there is more um, knowledge on how to handle the coronavirus. Uh, so we take uh, precautions, sanitary precautions more seriously. There's also available equipment that wasn't there before. Um, uh, CHSLD and residences uh, really understood the need to have a, a, a family involved because it's beneficial to the care as well to the person, uh, especially those who are, who are having suffering from dementia. All of this has contributed to decrease the, the number of infections, but uh, older persons still at high risk. And, and we know that the trend is, as it is in the second wave, is there is more uh, younger persons, middle-aged persons having the disease, but progressively, the older population is getting affected, not to the same uh, uh, degree, but they are. And they are unfortunately those who will have the worst consequences in terms of seriousness of the lung infections and, and, and loss of autonomy and all the rest. So we have still to be careful. Okay. All right, so today's webcast is all about understanding dementia. So we're gonna begin with Dr. Goche, and I'm gonna ask you a question that I get all the time. So what is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? And if you can also explain some of the signs and symptoms and evolution of the disease. Thank you, Claire. This is the classic question indeed. And uh, the short answer is uh, Alzheimer's disease is one cause of dementia. It is the most common cause over age 80 by far. But what's new is that you can have Alzheimer's disease in your brain and you never get a symptom in your life and you die at 95 or something else. So there's a new uh, way to look at Alzheimer's disease now, recently three years, as um, part of the normal brain aging process where you have buildup of certain proteins. But if you don't get a stroke and you don't have another problem on top of aging, like drinking too much, um, head injuries. Uh, you need a third factor at play to bring out symptoms in most people over age 80. Remember that Alzheimer's disease was discovered by a psychiatrist in Germany with a young woman in her 50s. And it turns out she had familial Alzheimer driven by a gene that we can now test for. And uh, this is the least common cause of dementia, this type of Alzheimer in very young people. 
So we have to rethink Alzheimer's disease now more and more. Geriatricians are very well suited to do this, if I may say so, Jose, because you're used to people who have comorbidity, multiple conditions at the same time, and they play into each other. In other words, if you have a healthy nine-year-old who gets a fever, he or she may get more confused than a 25-year-old. Um, if you get a small stroke, uh, even a silent one uh, in an older person who has already aging in their brain, it may tip the balance into having symptoms that persist and interfere with daily life. So, so the short answer is um, Alzheimer's is one cause of dementia, but the long answer is it's a very different disease if you're younger than 65 or older than 80. Why is that? Uh, it's uh, simply that the younger you are, the less stroke, the less other conditions are at play, such as Parkinson. Mm -hmm. It's mostly amyloid and tau proteins, whereas over age 80, it's always a mix of different things. The good side of that, this observation, is that you can control risks for stroke. You can mm -hmm. control certain other factors at play in brain aging. And uh, this is currently, uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada is going to promote this, What's good for the heart is good for the brain. Preventing mm -hmm. stroke is a way to prevent dementia. Mm -hmm. So can you just describe some of the most common cognitive and physical symptoms that people will see with dementia? I'll, I'll, get, I'll get started with this, but maybe Jose also can add his own experience because mm -hmm. it's going to be different in uh, someone who has multiple conditions over age 80, mm -hmm. perhaps, than someone younger like I see in their 60s or mm -hmm. 70s. But most people with Alzheimer's disease, at the beginning of symptoms, it's really memory lapses that are starting to interfere with their daily life, whatever it is. They could be at work still or just retiring or having trouble playing their bridge games. But it gets a little more serious when... Um, they forget uh, something that has consequence, like um, meeting someone, uh, picking up a child in daycare, if you're a grandparent. It's this gray zone of being forgetful to the point where it interferes with daily life in a serious way, and it's progressing over at least three to six months. It's not due to depression, but, but they can coexist at first. Mm -hmm. Once you're over the first year of these uh, mostly memory symptoms, you can have trouble with words. Um, not just remember names, finding the word for common objects, or you can have trouble finding your car in the parking lot. Of course, everybody's listening. Yeah, it happened to me once at the airport. Yes, that's normal. But we're talking about persisting symptoms uh, that are over at least six months duration. Uh, after two, three years, um, it's hard to make decisions for yourself. You need more and more help from your family or friends. And and then eventually it affects your uh, ability to cook or dress, get dressed by yourself. We're talking about year five or six. And eventually, if you live that long, you can have trouble, a bit like Parkinson, with uh, difficulty walking, uh, risk of fall, difficulty swallowing liquids. And after eight years, most people who have Alzheimer's disease, dementia, will have a pneumonia. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Mora, along with these uh, symptoms that Dr. Gauthier mentioned, there's a lot of what we call challenging behavior, uh, especially with people who have been diagnosed with frontal tem temporal dementia, for example. Can you describe what some of these symptoms look like? Because I think a lot of people don't realize it's part of the disease and, and, and they really feel like, oh my gosh, what, am I, what can I do with these type of behaviors? Yeah, uh, the, dementia brings about changes of our own personality and as they are struggling with their memory, uh, they can have increased anxiety and or feel very depressed as Dr. Guti already mentioned. But uh, as the dementia progresses, uh, their, uh, their understanding of the surroundings, their appreciation of the emotions of others, plus the continuous difficulty they have to uh, concentrate, you know, uh, find answers in their own brain for the difficulties they are experiencing. They can get agitated, you know, um, and, and uh, they can be physically very disruptive and even aggressive so much they cannot control your emotions. You know, all of us, sometimes it happens uh, because frustrating situations, we can become mad. But so imagine that if you have less brain capacity to deal with these frustrating situations, you can really lose control of yourself. This is what we do observe. But 
together with uh, this type of physical manifestations, there is others such as wandering. We don't understand why they are always looking for something that they don't have, but this is uh, behaviors that become very difficult to control. And obviously, as it reaches the brain where they generate ideations that are off reality, eh? Uh, uh, they start imagining things that are not real. This can also pose a tremendous challenge. An example being that uh, uh, a spouse start feeling that the other one is cheating, for example, mm -hmm. uh, or, or even thinking that, that uh, uh, they are stealing from them things that they cannot find. They cannot find because they forget what it is. And th if they are living with a spouse, uh, uh, they, they will think that this, this is the person who is doing it, you know? So it creates tremendous pressure in the couple, in the family, when there is a daughter that is coming to visit a father who, who uh, is losing memory. If she's the only one going to the house and things are not, uh, cannot uh, be found, it's because she is stealing it. So this is a justification for many of the behaviors that are, we know they are not, uh, um, you know, acceptable, but we have to show understanding um, and have the right approach that I could mention a few, but we can also address this more specifically, you know. I guess what's really, really challenging for family members is the fact that the disease causes a person to lose their sense of logic, right? So even if you try to explain to somebody on a daily basis that, you know, this, these conspiracy theories of cheating or stealing are not true, the disease doesn't allow the person to think logically, correct? Yes, so we have to show a lot of empathy, a lot of understanding. Sometimes it's just a question of also not insisting too much because the person will forget, come back a little later, and, and then the ambiance will already be more, more soft and more easy to deal with. Obviously, if you manifest yourself as the person with your capacity that you are angry and frustrated, this will just create even more frustration and reactions from the person suffering from dementia because th that person is more limited. So we have to still uh, uh, show a good control of ourselves, which is not always easy because as, as a family member, we have expectations from the person that for so many years was behaving logically and reasonably, and now she's no longer being this way. And, and we, some of the caregivers, obviously, because it's a continuous uh, uh, stress, they are, you know, anxious themselves, tired, exhausted, which doesn't help the picture, obviously. And, and one of the most challenging behaviors is that also, um, I hear often is that a person refuses to shower or bathe, okay, like it's really difficult. Why is that? Can one of you answer that? Yes, I mean, we all have an understanding why we should, uh, you know, <laughs> wash ourselves and dress properly. And there's purpose and meaning, you know, if I'm going to meet with the prime minister, I shouldn't be going, you know, uh, fine. So this information is lacking. So uh, uh, if you impose too much on doing it without providing explanations, if, if the, you change the routine, you change the, the schedule, people sometimes they prefer to take their shower or their bath in the evening, others in the morning. If you do the switch of the routine of that person, there will be more opposition. Sometimes I, I, tell, I tell caregivers to say white lies, you know, to favor the, the, uh, the, particip the participation of the, the person suffering from dementia, such as, oh, let's get dressed because uh, so someone uh, will come or we need to go out. Just justifications for, for go, going and take, and take a bath or, or being washed, you know. Mm -hmm. But it can be very demanding, no doubt. Dr. Goche, you wanted to add something before? Oh, it was uh, just an observation related to COVID because we've been questioning people living at home who are part of an observational study at McGill. And we were surprised to see that people who actually have uh, even mild dementia are less worried about COVID because they just don't understand the seriousness of the infection. And we couldn't measure the stress level going up in the family members and stable in persons living with dementia. So all this to say there is some, rel some level of protection um, from having mild dementia, even by not being aware of all the bad things around you. Uh, the other thing that's not yet been mentioned is um, people don't realize that they're losing some of their abilities. They still want to drive the car, or they still want to go to the bank 
And uh, this uh, lack of awareness that you have a problem and a disease uh, is very frustrating indeed for, for some families. And my point finally is that it's one of the things you teach well, Claire, is um, the education to the caregiver mm -hmm. is actually what mm -hmm. will help the behavior. It's not a pill. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. understanding mm -hmm. the behavior. That's something you do yeah. very well. Yeah, and I think I think one of the most important points for people to really re realize is that the person is not doing what they're doing on purpose. It's not yeah. them. It's the disease that's doing it. I often like to compare it as like this little person sitting on their shoulder telling them to say certain things or telling them to behave that way. But it's really not them. And I think for, for a lot of caregivers, it's very frustrating because they're like, why are they repeating themselves 100 times? Why are they doing this? What you need to know, it's it's not their fault. They're not doing it on purpose. So that's important. So, you know, when we talk about, because, you know, a lot of people are isolated right now, it's November, we're all starting to feel like housebound. So of course, you know, we're gonna start nitpicking and we're gonna, it's, it's, we're, we're, we're feeling like cabin fever a lot, right? So sometimes these behaviors can escalate. Now, Dr. Moret, when does it become dangerous for a caregiver? Like what type of behaviors, like, you know, either physical, verbal, sexual even, you know, when does it become dangerous for the caregiver? Yeah, there is a, a level of dangerosity uh, when when uh, the person suffering from dementia is not recognizing their loved one and and uh, uh, treat that person as a, a, a stranger in the house. You can imagine the scenario that you find yourself uh, with with someone that uh, is not supposed to be there. You can be very aggressive. So. Any physical aggression, uh, uh, you, you should protect yourself and, and request some help. Uh, I think that this sound that every caregiver should have a good friend they can call at any time uh, because you, you might not uh, uh, alone know exactly how to react. So having that support as a good friend that you can call at any time can be important. Uh, in terms of uh, um, you know sexual disinhibition, uh, uh, in terms of wondering uh, if the pattern is disturbing and insisting, uh, we have to protect the caregiver. Uh, sometimes we give medication, and medication is indicated, you know, when you are having hallucinations, uh, uh, seeing things that are not real or believing things that are not real, that triggers an emotion response that, that, that can be dangerous. So we need to deal with that trigger, that hallucination and there's medication for that. The rest, I mean, there is cases in with our best approach, uh, they, they need to be placed in an environment that is safe for them, uh, that protects the person suffering from dementia. And at the same time, uh, it goes to a process of a separation from the family. Uh, but this is still very, a very, um, I would say, uh, um, in terms of perception, a very low percentage, but it's part of the possibilities and understanding the different stages of dementia, the different consequences, apps one to uh, foresee what is coming and look for the right uh, support, you know. So let's talk about the role of medication. So Dr. Gauthier, what is the role of medication? I mean, is there a magic pill that's coming up with regards to curing uh, dementia uh, or are we using it more now to manage challenging behaviors? So thank you for the question. So there's no magic pill. So we have to use the one we have for now, but we have good ones indeed. So if you have depression, especially in the early stage, when you're still relatively aware of what's happening and what's coming, by all means, antidepressants work well. Um, that's for about a year. And then you can stop the antidepressant. Sometimes when you have challenging behaviors, like we just discussed, uh, the up, up at night, not recognizing always the house or the spouse, sometimes antidepressants given in the evening help also. If they don't and you have persistent uh, false beliefs with, without hallucinations, then you need low doses of antipsychotics. Then there's another kind of medication, which uh, we worked here in Montreal 20, 25 years ago. These are medicines that increase the brain level of a transmitter called acetylcholine. So these, uh, this led to medications that are prescribed, donepezil or aricept, rivastigmine or exelon, galantamine. And um, these medicines uh, are mostly prescribed in the early stage of uh, Alzheimer's disease or related conditions. It works also in other kinds of dementias. Um, with the increase of acetylcholine, some people, maybe 50%, have 
there's an obvious improvement in uh, their uh, interest in doing things. They may not remember more, but they're interested in trying something they used to do well. So that's picked up by the family and they're quite happy. So that's about a year or two of a slower decline of symptoms, but it doesn't change the underlying pathology in the brain. That's what is the next sort of a generation of medicines that are being tested and more to come next year. Uh, medicines that will take away from the brain the buildup of uh, uh, proteins. Uh, remember, it's a buildup over 20 years on average. So it will take mm. special medicines to take this out of the brain in a gentle way so you don't shock the brain. Some of the medicines require injections every month. So this is a challenge how we're going to handle infusions, but it can be done at home by trained nurses. Other medicines we're going to test next year are just oral pills that also take away the amyloid and tau protein in the brain. Then the big question is, when is the right time to use these medicines? So we're very mm -hmm. conscious that someone with very mild Alzheimer, very mild symptoms, maybe the best stage to use these new medicines. Whereas someone who already has moderate to severe dementia, cannot live alone, these medicines are not for that person. So... In addition to medicine and medication to manage child, let's talk about some coping strategies, okay? Because we have a lot of people, again, taking care of somebody at home. So Dr. Moha, you said earlier that you, were, you had some tips for caregivers. So how could, you know, besides it, like the, I really believe in the compassionate lie, you know, um, what other tips would you have? Um, I mentioned already previously that, that uh, knowing the disease, the disease, understanding the stages of the disease, uh, um, its consequences. All of this uh, uh, makes the caregiver uh, in control of the situation uh, and can plan ahead. Uh, I, I don't think a, a, a family caregiver uh, alone can do and, and you know, be capable of handling uh, all the, the care and support needed. For this reason, uh, you know, when we reach stages in which uh, the planning is being, you know, uh, uh, perturbed, <laughs> is being, becoming more difficult to look after oneself. Uh, the person, um, I mean, the caregiver should, should look for help, assistance, and the person should be known to the, the, the community services so that two things can happen. Assistance for, for personal care of the person suffering from dementia. At the same time, finding uh, some respite, you know, uh, because one needs to get out of this 24-hour pressure to find ourselves, uh, uh, get, 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 refill our batteries. And, and this is true uh, protected time in which that caregiver will do something else. Um, so it is important also is to have someone, I alluded to this already, in which we, we, we can call and talk, you know, uh, and maybe that person also could come and share some time with uh, uh, the, the member of the family who, is, who suffers from dementia. But it is important that there is some, some emotional support in someone that you trust. Facing the disease alone, uh, uh, it's not the right, it's not a healthy approach. Uh, it's not the right approach. And one has to recognize ourselves when we are overburdened, uh, if we are getting more frustrated, uh, less tolerant, uh, because uh, we not, might be exhausted and we, we should seek help, uh, including our own health that is sometimes neglected because of lack of sleep uh, and some aches and pains because we are providing bathing, we are uh, doing so much support to lift the person with, uh, who, has show, who is now showing uh, mobility issues. So for all of this reason, we should never face the disease alone by ourselves and be connected with others and the, the support system. You know, I mean, many caregivers feel that incredibly overwhelming sense of guilt or responsibility that only they can take care of their loved one and nobody else can help. And, you know, one of the, 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 the comments I hear the most from caregivers is, well, many thanks, I'm all good, I don't need help. Um, but, you know, in my own case, I mean, I ended up suffering a very severe nervous burnout, not only because of caregiving, but because in our lives, we have other things happening. It's, we're not just caring for a loved one, we have other things going on. And so, you know, when we were talking about um, aggressive behavior, I think we also need to 
ourselves, recognize as caregivers, when are we on the verge of burnout? Are we the ones starting to display that aggressive behavior, right? Are we the ones screaming too much or starting to hit our loved one because we can't take it anymore? Do you, do you see that in, your, in, in the families that you're working with? Yes, of course, it's very human. We have uh, aspirations. We want the best for, the, for uh, our family member who is suffering from dementia, but then that person is not responding to all the efforts you are making, which is tremendously uh, uh, stressful. And, and we can lose control. And the more obsef obsessive you are as a personality, the more conflicts it will generate. Um, and this is then time to have help, assistant, assistance coming from the community service of a fam or a family member uh, mm -hmm. so that uh, it can make the situation a bit more uh, vivable. Eh? <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Because otherwise, as I say, instead of having two pa uh, one patient, I will have two. <laughs> a patient suffering from dementia and a patient with burnout. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think one, one piece of advice that I'd like to offer people, especially now during this time of isolation, is really to pick your battles. You know, because we're, we're spending so much time, whether or not the person has any cognitive issues. You know, I, I have a girlfriend who said to me the other day, oh my gosh, if I hear my husband chew his cereal one more time, I'm going to just kill him. But I think what happens with this isolation is really pick your battles. Like if the person is doing something that is not endangering themselves, like if they're changing their clothes 10 times a day and it's not hurting anybody, let them do it. If they're keeping themselves busy by, you know, taking everything out of a closet and putting it back in or just repetitive and they're not hurting anybody, let it go. And the, the other part that I hear a lot is person saying the, telling the same story over and over again. I say to people, join their journey. Just nod your head, agree. But if you start constantly telling them that stop this, stop doing that, why are you doing this? You're going to trigger that challenging behavior. Would you agree with that? Um, maybe Dr. Gauthier could, co could comment. Uh, I'm pretty sure that, that like myself, we face this very commonly. Uh, the point I want to add to what you said, Jose, is that uh, people should be perhaps on the look for diversified uh, means of assistance, especially nowadays where the CLSC is not able to cover all uh, the fronts. Um, ADI, Alzheimer's Disease Inc., uh, the Alzheimer's Society of Canada, coming center, obviously. Um, and then community resources like La Corale, when we were able to go out more, a lot of men and women we're enjoying these social events. In my town in Hudson, we have the uh, VONs and NOVA uh, also providing uh, help. So maybe my plea would be wherever you live, um, try to diversify your resources. You cannot depend on just one, especially if they cannot be um, made available for one reason or another. Yeah. I'd like to touch upon the, the topic of safety just to a small degree, because I know it is such a big topic, but you know, since many people are living at home and they're isolated, you know, what, what are some of the safety considerations that need to be done? And also with regards to driving, as you mentioned before, I mean, is it appropriate to maybe let somebody know that they do have memory issues so that, you know, when it's time to take away the car, because it is dangerous, um, at what point should we be honest with the person? Uh, I can start with this because it, I face that often. I actually have people yeah. refer to me on, for the specific purpose to take their car away. <laughs> so <laughs> it's part of management, uh, part of planning. So the, the, once you have a diagnosis of um, whatever cause of the impairment that is affecting your ability to drive, it could be your vision, macular degeneration, it could be Parkinson, slow reaction time. In the context of Alzheimer, it's more difficulty with orientation Where's your car? Which is the way home? Especially if you have a detour, unexpected detour. Mm -hmm. um, that's manageable with a cell phone in the car or someone with you in the car. So in Quebec, we're lucky and most of the provinces in Canada, there is a step-by-step -step approach to the driving so the person can drive accompanied. There just comes a point where there's safety concern for reaction time and then of course the person should stop. So actually it's part of the visit if you see someone every six months, every year, I don't know if, Josie, you do that with the older persons you see over age 80, but we ask about driving. We ask about finances. Is someone helping you? Do you have a power of attorney? It, it is part of the management. So it's a little easier when it's time to stop because they knew it was coming. I, I would agree, Serge. Indeed, is an important component of our assessment. 
uh, on our six months or annual assessment. Um, uh, and your points, uh, it, it's what we do uh, try to apply when we see uh, our patients to go by, by uh, progressive uh, uh, you know, checks and, and allow something that is still feasible versus uh, then stop cold turkey, as one say. But these other issues also with medications for those who are living alone. When there is a caregiver, you know, this person can take the responsibility to make sure that uh, the medications are given. Uh, if, if a person is alone, then we, we have to develop a system to verify that the medications is taken properly because sometimes they forget and they take two, twice as much that they should with its mm -hmm. consequences. There is a lot of safety issues, security issues, uh, uh, because if the dementia is, is advanced and they, they leave the house, they can really get lost. And, and in weather such as our winter in North America can be very dangerous. Uh, there is also uh, safety in regards of uh, the oven, meal preparation, to do with bedding where uh, wet surfaces can contribute to, to falls. Uh, and and uh, even uh, in the meals, you know, some, some food that is not fresh, rotten food that they, they don't know how to handle it and they may take something that is contaminated. All of this is, is the cause why uh, a person suffering from dementia, uh, they, they, they lose the capacity to look after themselves and put them into a danger danger if there is not someone really besides protecting them, you know. So with the whole aspect then with, with regards to security, removing the license, assistance with, with, with finances, do you think then it's best that family members really to lean on the, on the doctor, the geriatrician or the neurologist to help them give the news to their loved one that perhaps it's time to stop driving, um, like let the news come from the doctor? Because I find a lot with families that you know, they're afraid to tell their loved one you have dementia, you have Alzheimer's disease, you have, you know, they're afraid to do that. Is it best then to rely on, on the doctors to give that information? I can start answering that because uh, I feel strongly it is the doctor's responsibility, but it should be the family doctor, not the specialist. There's not enough specialists to see everyone with dementia, and it's going to get okay. worse, uh, as you know, more okay. people with dementia in the future. So, mm -hmm. This is part of the education program you're starting at McGill. You train mm -hmm. the medical mm -hmm. students to have more empathy and think of a care plan after diagnosis. So what do we do now with the doctors already in practice? So we have a CME, we have a practice guidelines. So it's a continuous process. It's always improving compared to your experience in 2006 mm -hmm. with your mother. I'm sure it's much better now. And uh, yeah, the family interacts usually with the doctor through emails or some mean of communication before the visit and sometimes after the visit, because sometimes as you know, it's hard to de describe some behaviors or some issues with the person. But um, as a routine, uh, most of the families have one person designated to make a list of the issues before the visit. And mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. a post visit, mm -hmm. did we understand correctly this, this and that? Okay, so to properly prepare yourself for the list of questions before you meet with yeah. the doctor. That's very, yeah. very good. So we have um, just a couple minutes left because apparently we have a lot of questions for us. Um, so I will start with Dr. Mohan and Dr. then you, Dr. Gauthier. So what would be your most important piece of advice for families going through this journey? What would you tell families? Like, What do they need to do to prepare themselves? Um, if I start first, I would say that uh, it's important to know the condition. Uh, so, so that uh, there is not uh, uh, not uh, unexpected uh, uh, consequences, because you can prepare yourself. One little point we didn't tackle yet is is uh, in terms of uh, preparing a, a will and a mandate, mm. because as the disease progresses, the person will lose the capacity to designate someone to uh, do things for for. The person who wants they lose their capacity. So it's important to have some legal document in which mm -hmm. eventually in the future when this person will lose the capacity, uh, then someone else can do it for, 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 for the person suffering from dementia. Um, th this is an important aspect. Um, 
and uh, you know maybe I, can, I cannot emphasize enough what you just said the importance to have that that mandate without the mandate you cannot make any decisions on behalf of your loved one I mean when I had to move my mom from her apartment into a residence I was not even able to call Bell or Videotron or anybody without that mandate so that's probably one of the most important documents that you should have with you at all times and Very the other important. thing is the law is being changed. You may have heard uh, recently the la loi du, du curateur au Québec is being uh, upgraded and uh, people should stay tuned to the um, details of um, what you used to call curatorship. It's going to be more uh, in sync with the needs of the person now and the mm -hmm. person who needs help will still have their say in the decisions. Mm -hmm. I know that we have a lot of questions, so Joanne is going to come back on um, and 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 uh, do the questions. What I would like to tell everybody, though, is that uh, on the McGill Dementia Education website, we have a whole library of uh, amazing webcasts under the section of McGill Cares. There's about almost 30 of them right now. And on all of the topics relating to dementia and mandates and all kinds of information. So, and Dr. Morin and Dr. Goche are part of those webcasts. So I really encourage everyone, you know, to go and watch these webcasts, which will be able to expand on some of the topics that we've talked about uh, today. Thank you, Joanne. Okay, wow, that was amazing. Um, it made me come up with a bunch of questions, but I'm going to give the time to the questions of the attendees. Um, one of the things I just wanted to make a comment, Dr. More, you spoke a lot about the importance of caregivers taking care of themselves and looking for moments of respite. But we know that during COVID, respite is a challenge. We have that challenge here at Cumming Center because uh, we offer day programs that used to be in person and now are all done virtually. So obviously that minimizes the time that caregivers get for themselves. So the focus has been really very much on restorative respite. So that really means engaging in activities and engaging in the time that you have together in activities that are less related to caregiving and more related to fun and shared interests and reminiscence. So that's just a comment I wanted to punctuate on the fact that you you leveled that that point. Well, uh, de definitely. I mean, the COVID has, has changed a little bit the landscaping and how, how we provide the care service, how we provide uh, stimulation and, and respite, etc. And the work you do at the Coming Center uh, it shows already your, your resilience and the capacity to continue your mission despite despite the circumstances, obviously. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, some of the questions that came up, um, and you just talked about advanced planning. Someone did ask the question about the wait time in the process of homologations. Are you aware of any cha rules changing because of COVID? Mm, I, I am not. I am not. Uh, but uh, a good uh, lawyer, a good notary uh, should be able to uh, uh, you know, navigate the system so that things can be done in more efficient way. You know, uh, when when a notary asks for the medical evaluation and waits for the medical evaluation to then obtain the uh, psychosocial evaluation by a social worker or a occupation therapist, is a loss of time. Things needs to be conjugated, and and uh, this way, once these documents are available, the notary can go to court and 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 start the opening. Uh, the process to obtain, uh, you know, to homologate the mandate as we say it here. So we can be more efficient uh, knowing the system and knowing what is needed to do. And if the caregiver realizes that uh, it, it's time to obtain, you know, the, the full power to take decisions, uh, if, if th that person knows what the steps require to obtain this homologation, things can go uh, relatively fast in, in, in one, two months maximum. Uh, so I, is, can add, I can add information because uh, I have to do that often. We can fill the forms now online and they do accept electronic signatures, which was not obvious at first. Okay. So the medical assessment can be signed by the doctor electronically. This was uh, something we achieved during the pandemic. That's one less hurdle. Yeah. Thank you for that information. Um, somebody asked if the Douglas Center for Aging is opening and seeing patients. This is an individual whose loved one has not yet been formally diagnosed and is awaiting uh, that process. 
uh, I'll let you, Jose answer for his clinic, but uh, for, for our at the McGill Center for Studies in Aging on the grounds of the Douglas, we're not able to see people in person. We're working virtually. Okay. We are, um, in, in our clinic, it's, it's slowed down. We, we see a, uh, an activity of the clinic in person uh, is about 30 to 40% of its capacity. Uh, but we continue to do a lot of uh, follow-ups and even new assessments using telemedicine, mainly, mainly telephone medicine because of our population dealing with uh, Zoom platforms or Teams is sometimes difficult uh, unless there is a family member besides to assist. But we are trying to, you know, keep up with the demands. Always a challenge. Um, someone on the topic of medication, uh, and I know I'm jumping from, from topic to topic, but the questions came out at, at different times in, in our conversation. Uh, is memantine no longer being used for the mid-stages of the disease? Yes, I can answer that quickly. Memantine is indeed another class of medication that is specific for Alzheimer and to some degree other dementias. It's more effective in the moderate stage and uh, Rule of thumb, you start with the drugs in, in, increasing acetylcholine brain content that we discussed, and mematin is added next. Uh, this is roughly, uh, if you do a scale of uh, 1 to 30 points on the memory test, it would be between 10 and 20, so the middle stage of the disease. Okay. Um, cette, cette question a été posée en français, alors je vais le poser en français. Vous pouvez répondre en français aussi. Uh, quand ma mère était à la maison, avec les services CLSC, elle refusait de se laver et prendre les médicaments. Avez-vous des avis ou des suggestions? D'après la question, euh, la dame n'est plus à la maison. Mais en général, euh, pour ce qui est des médicaments, on peut les écraser et les donner avec euh, de la compote de pommes ou euh, de la confiture. Il euh, y a moyen de le faire. C'est surtout plus un problème dans les soins euh, plus, plus au stade sévère de la maladie où les gens ont de la misère à avaler tout court. Il faut écraser pas seulement les médicaments, mais couper en petits morceaux euh, la nourriture, on mange en purée. Pour ce qui est de se laver, comme on a dit tout à l'heure, il euh, faut choisir ses batailles. Il y a des choses plus importantes que d'autres. Alors, si une journée, elle n'est pas lavée, ce n'est pas grave. Le truc, c'est de trouver le meilleur moment de la journée, la bonne température, le bon environnement, peut-être la musique en même temps. Euh, il y a des trucs comme ça qui peuvent aider. Mmh. Et je vais ajouter aussi à propos du bain puis de la douche. Si la, la proche aidant va force, va vraiment, veut vraiment forcer la personne, ça va créer une mémoire négative. Alors, c'est vraiment l'approche de la personne. Si on dit aux gens, OK, il faut que vous lavez, puis on essaie de pousser la personne, il ne faut pas faire ça parce que la personne va se souvenir que oh, c'est une, une situation très euh, inconfortable. Alors, il faut créer vraiment une atmosphère calme, positif et comme Dr. Gauthier mentionne, si un jour il ne veut pas prendre sa, sa, sa douche, laissez-lui, laissez mais en assez encore, mais avec une attitude très relaxe et positive. I think these answers actually speak a bit to another question that was asked by an attendee about um, when their loved one who has progressive dementia wants to always go out and can't understand why they can't do this alone and they don't understand why, especially during COVID, how to respond. And maybe you could, you may have some very specific points to this type of uh, responded behavior, but perhaps uh, we may have answered it also with some of your ideas. I have lived several uh, of these cases, you know, it's not that the older person uh, uh, or the person suffering from dementia is uh, uh, prohibited to go out. It's just that if the person goes out, some precautions need to take place. Um, the mask for them can be very disturbing because they don't uh, they don't understand necessarily all the purpose for that but remind you that the wearing the mask is a compensation for not being able to maintain the distancing if you not within two meters you know uh then uh you have to have a mask but otherwise walking in on 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 the street on on the sidewalk, what a spouse who suffering from dementia, uh, you can protect that person and do the walk. And the walk can be extremely b beneficial to decrease anxiety and at the same time promoting some some uh, some uh, mobility. So it's feasible. It's not that it's totally forbidden. 
what would be more forbidden is being in contact uh, in, in a, a mall or, or going to a, a store. And th th then is more, more uh, difficult because there is more people, more, but going out, walking, it's, it's accessible. I'd like to support that because uh, through the seven months, these uh, video conferencing with families, clearly those who feel the best are the ones who go out every day mm. for walks. I just want to add, though, with regards to safety measures, because a lot of people do ask, what, you know, my, my, my loved one has you know, medium stage dementia. You know, it's okay. They're still going out. Like, what is the danger of them just going on their walk? The only thing I want to caution people is as the disease progresses, you know, the reflexes. So looking before you cross the street, recognizing stop signs, recognizing green light, red light, yellow light, you know, it's at whole, you know, as it progresses, the person may not necessarily always have the reflexes to look both ways before stepping off the curve. So these are, these are, you know, if they get to that point where they seem a little bit confused, that, that's why they can't go out and accompany. Because I often hear people saying, oh, it's okay, they still do their routine. But because it's a disease that's ever evolving, you just need to err on the side of caution, especially as the disease is advancing. Thank you. I think this goes hand in hand with a question someone asked about sun, sundowning. That's a well-known term. Um, what is it and what can be done? I can, I can start uh, because it's the season now. <laughs> November is the worst month because it's dark at five o'clock. So sundowning, the syndrome du crépuscule in French, is this anxiety that builds up uh, late afternoon and all the symptoms we talked about earlier, uh, anxiety, uh, agitation, restlessness, um, it's worse at the end of the day. So the, besides more light in the house, a pleasant surroundings, music, put something fun on TV, whatever. If that's not good enough, what sometimes helps is an antidepressant uh, in the late afternoon, uh, one of those that are a bit sedative. So there's specific medications we can try. It doesn't always work, but uh, the other one that sometimes helps is memantin. It's one of the things memantin appears to do in many people. It's to prevent the sundowning to some degree. Uh, Le Jose, your experience? Uh, I, I, I like to mention that um, this phenomenon in seen, is seen uh, also with babies. You know, by the end of the afternoon, babies tend to be a little bit more irritable, crying a bit more, complaining a bit more. So it is as if there is more fatigue in the brain. They didn't have the capacity to uh, do some cleanup. <laughs> um, and and uh, what you have just proposed is what is recommended. Occasionally, there is a need for medication to be given. Uh, in prophylaxis, meaning that even before uh, the, the crisis could start, then we give medication that has a, an anxiolytic effect, but we have to be uh, sure that it's not certain types of uh, 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 medications that will make then, uh, after the sleep, a worse situation. Yeah. I'm talking here about benzodiazepines that we should try to avoid, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Est-ce que dans votre expérience, tout leur sens de créativité est au point mort? Est-ce que la musique dans leur environnement leur apporte un répit? Alors, je vais essayer de I répondre. Oh, it's a good question. C'est une bonne question. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Effectivement, les gens qui ont déjà joué du piano vont continuer à jouer du piano, même euh, dans un stade avancé de la maladie. Tout le monde a vu la vidéo de la danseuse en, en Allemagne, oh, je oui. crois, qui oui. euh, a fait les mouvements euh, du, du lac des signes euh, avec la musique, même à un stade très avancé. Et euh, effectivement, la musique mérite toujours d'être essayée, même à un stade, un stade avancé de la maladie. Euh, les chorales, les gens qui aimaient chanter, euh, vont se rappeler de vieilles chansons pendant très longtemps dans leur maladie. Alors oui, tout à fait. Il y a, a d'autres sortes de créativité dans, qui sont à euh, l'essai dans les... Euh, Les centres mémoire, les, 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 les centres de jour de la société Alzheimer, par exemple, l'art, différentes techniques de peinture, euh, tout, ce, tout ce qui est peut-être manipulé avec les mains. Euh, le Musée des beaux-arts de Montréal a aussi toute une, une école là-dessus, euh, euh, l'art pour personnes qui, qui a la maladie d'Alzheimer. Alors oui, très bonne question à encourager. Oui. C'est reconnu depuis euh, un certain temps déjà que euh, la thérapie récréationnelle uh, par des thérapistes, des, des, des ergothérapeutes, etc. C'est très bénéfique pour uh, non seulement maintenir la concentration, uh, uh, 
faire en sorte que la personne euh, se sent valorisée, tout ça a des effets bénéfiques pour le cerveau et, et, euh, et euh, c'est mieux pour la personne et aussi pour le caregiver aussi. Effectivement. Um, we'll have two more questions and then we'll close. One uh, question was, someone was talking about uh, an interview with Dr. Lisa Moscone, who conducts research at the Alzheimer Prevention Clinic. She said that two thirds of Alzheimer's patients are women and that hysterectomy and hormonal decline can lead to, to Alzheimer's. She recommends certain lifestyle changes to prevent this. Any thoughts on this? Uh, okay, I will say something. Uh, it's not surprising that there is more women suffering from dementia because they live longer and aging is a risk factor. Um, you know, um, the, the question of hormones, yes, our, our, our body depends a lot of hormones and women unfortunately suffer a, a major decrease in, in estrogen. But uh, studies in which estrogens have been given as uh, therapy have not shown to my, my knowledge any uh, significant effect? Maybe Dr. Gauthier could comment a bit more. Uh, you, just on the point of uh, indeed giving Primarin-like drugs to women who were at risk of having Alzheimer, actually Primarin was worse than placebo and mm -hmm. the study had to be stopped right away. So I understand the point of view that you brought up um, that uh, indeed after menopause, there's a change of uh, patterns of risk, uh, f biologically speaking, for women. But unfortunately, hormone replacement has not um, panned out so far as a, a preventive approach. Okay, I'm just, there's been a few more questions that have come in at the end. Uh, one question that came out the beginning was, how can someone access uh, being uh, considered as a participant in the research study? I'll give a quick answer. Claire generously offered to put on the uh, Dementia program at McGill, the websites, the link to the various yes. research programs. So I encourage you to, to look them up. Yeah, okay. go to mcgill.ca slash dementia resources and you'll find the link to the uh, program that Dr. Gauthier is referring to. Okay, so I'm going to mention a few closing remarks. I apologize to those participants whose questions may not have been answered, but you certainly can um, contact uh, through the website. There is, I'm sure, information that can be received through there. And certainly, should you require some more support and have some questions, um, you can certainly contact us at Cumming Center. Our phone number is 514-342-1234. So I'd like to, uh, first of all, thank everybody. We have 107 people on this call today, so that's incredible. Thank you for joining us today for this very, very rich and what I believe was a very informative session. Uh, thank you to our esteemed panel for your expertise, and it was delivered with such uh, warmth and care. Um, we're inspired, really, by your dedication and sharing your knowledge with all of us. So this closes our event. Um, you will be receiving a questionnaire because we really want to make sure that we continue to have these conversations and use your feedback to guide us in the future. Uh, we hope, and it's our sincere wish, that you're all walking away today um, feeling maybe more supported, uh, more informed, and guided in your own unique journeys. So thank you so much, everyone. Wow. Thank you. It was thank a pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.